Find in your Bibles John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We continue a series this morning. We began a few weeks ago a series entitled Miracles. Do you need a miracle in your life? Jesus is a miracle worker. John reveals seven signs or miracles that Jesus performed, and John's desire is to point to the deity of Jesus, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that Jesus is God. And today from John chapter 5, we're going to talk about the miracle that changed everything, the miracle that changed everything. John chapter 5, begin reading with me in verse 1, we'll read to verse 17. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. Now some of your translations have the next verse, verse 4. Some of your translations do not have the next verse, verse 4. It goes straight from verse 4 three to verse five. So are you confused yet? Uh, there are there's a variant in the Greek text. Some Greek texts have this verse, some Greek texts don't have this verse. We'll read the verse uh, this this morning. So it says blind, lame, and paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. Whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. One man was there who'd been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he'd already been there a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water's stirred up. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Get up. Take up your bed and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. So the Jews said to the man who'd been healed, It's the Sabbath and it's not lawful for you to take up your bed. But he answered them, The man who healed me said to me, Take up your bed and walk. They asked him, Who's the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now, verse 13, now the man who'd been healed didn't know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn, and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said, see, you are well, sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who healed him. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. Remember the powers in the Word of God. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you so much for the truth of your Word and for its power. And Spirit of God, today, I pray that you would speak and work and move in an astounding, miraculous, and strong way in our lives. Spirit of God, have freedom to speak in this place. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today I'm talking about miracles, but I'm also talking about change. Is there something in your life that needs to change? You may say, there's something that needs to change in my life, but it would sure take a miracle. Well, I want you to know Jesus is a miracle worker. God can work miracles. He can do amazing and incredible, wonderful and spectacular things in your life. Jesus can bring about change. The word change simply means not to remain the same. The word change simply means to become different. So if there's something in your life that needs to change, I want you to be open to Jesus doing a great, marvelous, and incredible work in your life. I have no doubt today in this place there are people who need a miracle. There are people who need a marriage miracle. Your marriage is on the rocks. You're heartbroken. You're in a difficult circumstance. You can't figure out how to reconcile. There's frustration, there's anger, and there's bitterness. You need a miracle in your life. Let me tell you something. There are no hopeless situations when Jesus Christ is involved. You need a miracle. Some of you need a job miracle. You've lost your job or you're underemployed. You can't seem to get where you need to be in life because you can't seem to get the job that you need. You need a miracle in your job. 
Some of you need a money miracle. There's always more month at the end of the money, and you don't know what to do. And the mortgage is coming due. All the bills need to be due. You're behind on some things. And some of you say, I'm drowning in a sea of debt, and I need a miracle in my life to get through this. Some of you need a family miracle. There's some parents in here who have broken hearts because of their children. And you need God to work a miracle in your child's heart, in your child's life, and bring them home. You need God to do what only He can do. He, you need Him to work a miracle in your life. There are others in here, you need a health miracle. The doctors have said there's nothing else that, that they can do. There's no way that you can be healed medically. And you need God to work a miracle in your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the great physician. Let me tell you today, there's nothing in the world that's outside of the power and the might and the miraculous healing of Almighty God. Nothing is outside of His control. He can heal, He can work, He can do great and miraculous things in any of these areas. Every miracle that Jesus performed met a specific need. And the Bible, remember, tells us in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22 that Jesus was a man attested to you by God with mighty works, wonders, and signs. And do you remember why John wrote the book? Why did he write this gospel? John chapter 20 and verse 31, These things I have written to you that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that in believing you might have life in His name. There, there's a few things about these miracles that I think we need to notice. These miracles were instantaneous. Jesus would speak or touch, and instantly they'd be healed. These miracles were individual. They dealt with a specific need and a specific person. And these miracles were interruptions. And sometimes Jesus was interrupted. You know, one day he was headed to a place and there was a woman who touched the hem of his garment. And she was healed instantly. Other times he interrupted the lives of people. In fact, he interrupted the life of this man here in John chapter 5. That's, let, let me just tell you, you and I need to be ready for God to interrupt our lives anytime he so desires. We need to ask him, Lord, it's not about my plans, it's not about my wishes or wants, it's not about my agenda. I'm open for you to interrupt my life. You see, you should come here to church ready for Jesus to meet with you. But sadly, many people show up on Sundays with a do not disturb sign hanging around their neck. They don't want God to meet or to work or to do a great work. You don't want God to interrupt your life. That's why you pull out your cell phone and start texting. It's only, there, there's only one text you need to be worried about today, the text of Scripture. All right? That's why you start making your grocery list on the back of your bulletin. That's why you check Facebook or Twitter. It's why you, uh, you think Sunday morning is a time to take a good nap. But because we don't want to pay attention, we think, we think if we pay attention, God might interrupt our lives and we don't have time for that. Let me tell you something. All of us need God to interrupt our lives and to do great, mighty, and miraculous things that only He can do. We need to come. So, so let me encourage you today. Focus. Pay attention. Don't get up and walk around and, and head out and come back in unless it's absolutely necessary, a medical emergency. Don't be checking your phone trying to see if that sweet thing's done text you back, okay? Pay attention. Focus. Because this is the moment, the time, as the word is preached, where God can open your eyes and your heart, where he can work a miracle. So pay attention to what God would have to do in your life. Let's dive into the text, John chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Number one, notice this, a remarkable change for the man. A remarkable change for the man. We see this in the first nine verses. When Jesus performed a miracle, it changed everything. And the first thing we notice here is there's a remarkable change for the man. Notice letter A, the sad situation. These verses, verses 1 to 5, describe a very sad situation. This man needs a change in his life. And the Bible describes it in the first five verses as a very sad state. Look, look what the Bible says again in verse 1 and 2. After there was a feast of the Jews, the G Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, an Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofs 
colonnade. So get the scene and the picture in your mind. John's describing for you what's happening. He's telling you what's going on. Here it is. Jerusalem is packed. It's surrounded by uh, lots and lots of people because they're involved in one of the feasts. And there were several feasts. There was a feast of Passover. There was a feast of Pentecost. There was a feast of Tabernacle, the feast of booths. And anytime there was a feast, it was like a nationwide, citywide celebration. And so all over the place, I mean, people were just packed into Jerusalem. And the Bible tells us here that Jesus came to a place with roofed colonnades. Now, I'm from Kathleen, Georgia. We call those porches where I live, okay? Right? Jesus came to a place that had five porches and uh, over by the sheep gate. The sheep gate. Anybody have an idea why they called it the sheep gate? That's, That's where they let the sheep in and out of the city, Okay? That makes sense, right? He brought them in the sheep. The sheep go in the gate. They go out the gate. It's the sheep gate. These days, it's called St. Stephen's Gate because church tradition tells us that that is where Stephen was stoned, Acts chapter 7. And so here they are. This is the setting. There by the sheep gate, by five porches, is a pool in Aramaic, a pool called Bethesda. In fact, that pool is still there today. Archaeologists have... uh, have uncovered in a dig 40 feet below street level today a pool. It is the pool of Bethesda right there by the five porches near the sheep gate. So the pool is still there. You know the word Bethesda means? Bethesda means house of mercy. House of mercy. Now I want you to, I want you to get the contrast here. There are those, the Bible says, they're lame, they're paralyzed, they're sick. They're in desperate need of a miracle. The Bible says they're, they're invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. They're, they're many, many great needs. Verse 3 tells us there's all types of people there that are in misery. But the Bible tells us that right there is the place where the house of misery meets the house of mercy. Where pain and heartache and debilitating disease meets the love and grace and mercy of Almighty God. There's the place where mercy can be found. This reminds me a bit of how the church is supposed to be. Do you know, if you're a guest here today, you're going to learn something about our church. Do you know this church is full of people who have problems? All over the place. I mean, look around for a second. Everybody here has a problem. Some problems are bigger than others. Some problems are more public. Some problems are more private. But everybody here is a problem person. Everybody has problems. We all do. This is one thing that we ought to know about believers in Jesus Christ. We all have struggles and issues and heartaches. We're all struggling with some kind of issue or some kind of problem. You see, there are no perfect churches. If you find the perfect church, don't join it. You'll ruin it, right? You've heard that before. There are no perfect churches. There are no perfect pastors. They're no perfect people. We all have problems. But the church ought to be a place where people in misery come find mercy. The church ought to be a place where those of us who have problems gather together and say, I'm not perfect, you're not perfect, we're not perfect, but we come to a place where we can find mercy and help in time of need. This is a picture of what the church ought to be. People who don't have it all together, who don't know everything, who don't have it all figured out, come and lay their burdens down before the one who knows all, sees all, and loves all. That's the way the church ought to be. So we're not here pretending we're perfect. We're here with our problems and all, recognizing our great need for relationship with other believers and our great need for Almighty God. But Bethesda was a place where people with all sorts of problems came. Why were they there? Well, they were there because there was a legend in those days. The legend was that an angel would come and stir the water. And if an angel would come stir the water, whoever got in the water first would be healed. Was that what really happened? No, it's not what really happened. It was a legend in those days. It was a superstition. And so everybody would gather around this place. All those who were sick, blind, lame, paralyzed, all the invalids, the Bible says, would gather around that place. And it said whoever steps first into the pool would be healed. Well, archaeologists have discovered, as they've dug up this site, that that particular pool there in Bethesda is fed by underground springs. 
And from time to time, those underground springs that feed the pool will surge. And when the spring surges, what happens to the surface of the water? Well, the water's stirred. And so everybody thought, in those days, everybody thought, when the water's stirred, that's miraculous. There's an angel doing that. I need to get in the pool so I can be healed. What a sad place. Can you imagine the condition? Here are people depending on a legend, a superstition to save them and to heal them. Can you imagine all the difficulty, all the sickness that surrounded? The Bible says they were invalid. You know what that word means? They were sick. It means to be weak and it means to be without strength. But I want you to know the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6, for a while we were still weak. While we were still without strength. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. This is a picture of all of us. Apart from Jesus Christ, we're problem people. We're blind. We're hopeless. We're lame. We're paralyzed. We're desperate. How many people are just like this today? Already we've got people who are placing their hope in some political candidate for 2016. And they think that's going to fix all their problems. Come on, don't be so superstitious. There's no politician that can fix what we face. There's no politician that can give what we need. Who we need to be depending on is the one who sits on the throne in heaven. That's what we're desperate for. And see, we do the same thing today. We depend on all kinds of circumstances and situations. The real problem here is not a physical problem. It's a spiritual problem. Jesus is the only answer for the ultimate healing we need. And what does Jesus do? Notice this now. Imagine the scene. Here they are, blind, paralyzed, lame, diseased, gathered around this pool, waiting and hoping with with all of their might on some superstition or legend. Let me show you what we would do in this scenario. We would walk around. Find a way to go where we're going without having to get involved. Let me show you what Jesus does. He walks right to it. All the hopeless, all the helpless, all the blind, lame, paralyzed. And he gets right here in the middle. Right here in the mess. Right here, the people with the greatest need. That's where Jesus went. He walked right to those who desperately needed him most. He walked right to those who were in their greatest need. Hey, are there people here at Second Baptist Church who love people like that, who love people like Jesus loved people, who reach out to people like Jesus reached out to people, who want to help those who can't help themselves. And the Bible tells us that Jesus knew this man. He knew that he'd been there for quite some time. You know what Jesus is doing right now? You can't see him, but his spirit. He's walking around this place. Just like he did that day. And he sees all the needs. All the pain. All the heartache. All the struggles. And all the difficulties. He sees them all. And he walks right up to you. You see, we see a sad situation. Notice next. A strange question. What does he ask this guy? In verse 6, as Jesus approaches this man, he's in a sad situation. But we notice the strange question. Look at what he says in verse 6. So, when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time, he said to him, here it is, do you want to be healed? Have you ever imagined, just thought, how did Jesus say that? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? I don't know. How did Jesus say it? Any way he says it, it comes off initially as kind of a cruel question. What do you say to somebody who's been lame, paralyzed for 38 years? Wouldn't you like to walk? Can you imagine asking that question? It is an incredibly cruel question if you can't do anything about it. Imagine talking to somebody like that in a, in a wheelchair today. Well, wouldn't you love to walk? How cruel is that? But Jesus is not asking this question to be cruel. Think about it. This man has been lame for 38 years. Get, get the picture in your mind. 38 years. Four decades almost. 
That's a long time. That's a, that's a long life in Bible days. Almost a lifetime. He's been like that for 13,870 days. He's been like that for 332,880 hours. Almost 20 million minutes. This man has not been able to walk. But his question is purposeful. He's not being cruel. Listen to what he's saying. Do you want to change? You see, this man could no longer beg. This man would have to find a job and support himself. This man would no longer be depending on this legend. He'd no longer come to this gate. He'd no longer come to these porches. He'd no longer come to this pool. Everything was going to change for this man. Do you really want to change? You've been like this for 38 years. Do you really want to be different? I'm telling you something. People do this today. Some people say, I want Jesus to come into my life. I want Jesus to do a work in my heart. I want Jesus. But they don't really want him. What they want is a get out of hell free card. I want Jesus as long as he takes me to heaven and doesn't ask me to do anything else while I'm here on earth. That is not the way it works. When Jesus looks at you and says, do you want to be healed? Do you want to be saved? He's saying, are you willing to repent and trust me and give everything you are to me? I can work a miracle in your life, but it's going to mean you must change. Nobody, nobody ever comes to Jesus and stays the same. And this man, do you want to be healed? Well, look at what he says. Verse 7. Sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. And when the water's stirred up, and while well, I'm going on, another steps in before me. What's he doing? He doesn't even answer Jesus' question, does he? Do you want to be healed? What does he do? He doesn't say, yes, I want to be healed. He says, I, I can't be healed. You don't understand. Nobody can drag me to the pool. I don't have anybody that will do that for me. And when I'm trying to get there, I can't walk. When I'm trying to get there, somebody gets in first. I can't be healed. Notice several things about this man. First of all, he's depending on people rather than God. What does he say? I have no one. I have no man. Many people depend on their pastor or their Sunday school teacher or their life group leader or the church staff or their buddy. Listen to me. No one can do for you what God can do. No one can. Look to God. He depended on the circumstances rather than God. What does he say? I can't get in the pool when the water is stirred. People do this all the time. Well, you know, I know I need to get right with God. I'm going to wait till Easter. I know I need to get right with God. I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to wait till, uh, till Mother's Day when Mom will be here. That's when I'm going to get saved. I, I know I need to get right with God, but right now I'm living it up. I'm having a blast. I know I need to get right with God, but I'm going to wait until circumstances are right. Let me tell you, the right circumstance to come to Jesus, if you're lost, is right now, today. The Bible says now, today is the day of salvation. I have no man when the water stirred to put me in the pool. He limited God's work to a certain place. I got to get in the pool. If I can't get in the pool, I can't be healed. Let me tell you something. God's not limited to a place, space, or time. God can do a great, miraculous, and mighty work anywhere. And then he blames others for his past failures. Somebody else always gets in the pool before I get there. We do that all the time, too. I'm not where I need to be today spiritually because somebody hurt my feelings. They said something about my mama. They sat in my seat. They parked in my spot. And so I'm not following Jesus like I should today because somebody hurt me in the past. Can I just tell you in love, you've got to get over that and go on with God. You have to. You have to. You, you can't focus on the problems of the past and see the possibilities of the present and future at the same time. It doesn't work. And so this man's giving all kinds of excuses. But for him to remain the same is to remain lame. To stay the same means he can't walk. It's more than just recognizing my needs. You've got to respond. We need to be healed. You understand this? We're problem people. We've got problems all over us. And we need to be healed of bitterness and anger and resentment and frustration. We need to be healed of addictions and disease and lust. We need to be healed of so many things. And the question that Jesus asks you and me today is the same question he asked this man. Do you want to be healed? Are you really willing to change? Someone says that we never really change until the pain of staying the same outweighs the pain of change. Do, are you really willing to let go of the chains that bind you as a result of sin and trust and follow and honor the Lord Jesus? So we see a sad situation, a strange question. Next, we notice in verse 8, the surprising instruction. You know what Jesus does? He ignores the man's excuses 
This man's given all kinds of excuses why he can't be healed. He ignores his excuses and listen to what he says. Get up. Take up your bed and walk. In other words, Jesus is saying, forget about the superstition, forget about this legend, forget about an angel coming to stir the water, forget about all that stuff and do what I say and watch me work a miracle. Forget about all of the externals, trust in Jesus and follow him. Jesus was commanding him to do the impossible. He was commanding him to do something that was not physically possible for him. Jesus was working a miracle in this man's life. And I want you to know the Bible tells you to Jesus tells you to do the impossible. Do you know that? Jesus tells you, be holy for I am holy. You can't do that. You can't do that on your own, but in Christ you can. God calls us to do the extraordinary, amazing, and impossible. And then in grace, he empowers us and enables us to do what he's called us to do. That's miraculous. That's powerful. That's strong. He's commanding this man to do the impossible. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. Some people are here, I know what you're thinking right now, Pastor, you don't understand. You don't know my problems, you don't know my situation. I can't change. I'm in the midst of such a mess. It's overwhelming me. It's weighing me down. There's nothing that I can do. Don't you see that your misery is getting you to the place where you're so desperate for God, you want Him more than anything. Your misery will bring you to the point of meeting God's mercy. God can do a work, a miracle in you. Jesus is trying to tell him, forget the legend. Look at me. During this series, have you noticed that I haven't uh, put a big sign out by the Moody, Moody Road right here and said, you know, anybody wants a miracle, come show up. I hadn't put a big tent out on the lawn and dressed in a pretty white suit and start blowing on people to perform miracles. You noticed that, right? I haven't done that. Because this series, while it's entitled Miracles, and we see Jesus working miracles in the lives of individuals. While the series is entitled Miracles, the series is really all about Jesus. What you notice is these miracles were not the end result. The miracles were always used as a sign to point people to Jesus. The miracle was never a show. It was never entertainment. Jesus wasn't being a magician. What was he doing? He was revealing to people, Jesus is God. Trust him for salvation. That's what's going on. And so this morning, yes, I believe that Jesus can work miracles if he so desires. I believe that Jesus can do great, astounding and incredible things. But don't miss the master because you're desperate for a miracle. The master is the miracle. Jesus is the miracle. Look at what it says in verse 9. This changes everything at once. The man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. A miracle took place. The Bible says he walked. You know what the word means there? He walked around. Literally, he's walking throughout the crowd, and people are saying, Wait a second. Aren't you the guy that couldn't walk? And now you're walking. Pretty neat, right? He walked around. Everybody got to see him. And notice the simple admonition in verse 14. The Bible tells us that this man was given clear instructions from Jesus. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. Now, what's going on here? Is all sickness as a result of sin? No, it's not. Is all suffering personally as a result of some personal sin? No, it's not. But in this case, the Bible does make it clear from time to time that people are sick as a result of sin. So apparently, in this man's life, there was some type of sin, something. We don't know what, and there's no reason to speculate. But literally, what Jesus says to him is, stop sinning. Stop sinning that nothing worse may happen to you. What what could be worse than being paralyzed? Death, judgment, separation from God. Stop sinning that nothing worse may happen to you. And look what it says in verse 15. The man went away and told the Jews. 
It was Jesus who healed him. I believe this implies that this man, not just he believed that Jesus could heal him, but this man believed that Jesus was the Christ. He understood and believed who he was. So the greatest miracle here is not the healing of a lame man. It's the faith of a man trusting in Jesus for salvation. We see a remarkable change for the man. Number two, notice a real change for the master. And don't stress out on me, okay? Point number two and point number three are much, much shorter than point number one, okay? I know already you're like, my goodness, he's only on two. We're going to be here till, till one o'clock. No, focus. We're almost done. Number two, a real change for the master. Look at what the Bible says here in verse nine. And at once the man was healed, he took up his bed and walked. And what does it say, that last phrase? Now that day was the Sabbath. The Sabbath. What happens on the Sabbath? Well, the Pharisees had all kinds of rules. What did Jesus do? Jesus didn't heal this man on the Sabbath accidentally. He did it on purpose to expose the Pharisees, to expose their hypocrisy, their phoniness, their empty and legalistic rules and religion. They had 39 laws on the Sabbath. 39 laws on the Sabbath. And this man was breaking number 39. Don't carry anything. Don't carry anything on the Sabbath. And what was this man doing? This man was carrying his mat. He was carrying his bed. And they were concerned about what rule he was breaking. Do you see the nearsightedness here? This guy's just been radically transformed, changed by the power of Jesus. And the Pharisees come up to him and they don't say, Whoa, you're walking. Why are you carrying that mat? Do you, do you see their blindness and their hypocrisy? They're not thrilled because this guy's been changed. They're worried because he broke one of their rules. Don't carry anything on the Sabbath. And here this guy is who used to not be able to carry anything. And he's walking miraculously. And all they care about is he's breaking one of their rules. By the way, there's almost always a group of Pharisees that just miss it. Almost always. I mean, God can be working. People are getting saved, baptized. Church is growing. Things are awesome. I mean, Spirit of God's just moving in a great and mighty way. And there's somebody somewhere that's going to complain about something. Because they don't see the big picture. They get focused on all these small, little, minute things that don't matter a hill of beans in light of eternity. Here Jesus is, is, is exposing the hypocrisy. Look at what it says in verse 16. This is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. This marks a change, a transition in the ministry of Jesus. In fact, from this moment on, the Bible's clear. The persecution of Jesus begins to increase. He's beginning to make his way to the cross. This miracle began his road to the cross. Eighteen months after this miracle, Jesus was nailed to the cross of Calvary. Why? Was it the miracle? No. Verse 17 tells us why. Jesus answered them and said, My father is working until now, and I'm working. Well, what's the Bible tell us in verse 18? This is why the Jews were seeking to kill him, because not only did he break the Sabbath, he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Why did the Pharisees want to kill him? Yes, he broke their rules about the Sabbath, but more importantly, Jesus claimed to be God. They succeeded in killing him. Eighteen months after this miracle, they nailed him to the cross. No more would Jesus be a problem for the Pharisees, right? No more would this rule breaker lead a revolt against our religion. But what they did not know was that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, had the power over death, hell, and the grave. And three days later, the ground began to shake, and the tomb opened up, and Jesus Christ rose from the dead, victorious and glorious. Jesus Christ lives today, offering hope and salvation and rescue for people just like you and me, people who have all sorts of problems. The Bible tells us in Romans 5, 6, and 8, For when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. This leads me to the third thing. It's a question. You see a remarkable change for the man, a radical change, a real change for the master. And number three is a question, a radical change for me. What about your life? What about my life? Today I want you to ask this question, do I need a change? 
Do I need a miracle in my life? Do I need God to do something that only he can do? You see, you have to answer that question. I can't answer it for you. I can tell you this. If you're here today and you don't have a relationship with God, you desperately need a miracle from Jesus. You need him to save you. Just like at the pool of Bethesda, Jesus walks around this place today with people full of problems and heartaches and frustrations and bitterness, people full of all sorts of issues, and Jesus says, do you want to be healed? Do you? Do you? Do you? Do you? Do you you want to be healed? Today he asks the very same question. Are you willing to get up off the mat, the sin that keeps you down, and enjoy the freedom that Jesus offers. Only you can answer that question. Only you can trust him today and be healed.